Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Assembly Hall UWI. This session is titled Critical Analysis of Media Representation of Dance Hall. I am Demario McDowell, Founding Director of Supreme Promotions, with the promoters of Sting for the past 30, we're celebrating our 30th year this year. Um, hot Shot and maybe about 60% of the dance hall shows around town. We used to produce in the silly season era, running up to about the early 90s. Um, on our panel today, and before I do, I'd like to make, first make an apology for Miss Laura Correa, who would have spoken, well, given a presentation on Jamaican music and Brazilian advertising. She's unavoidably absent. So, to my right, and my extreme right, I'd like to introduce Mr. Melvin Cook, please give him a rousing round of applause for being here. He was speaking on, I am drinking which rum and Red Bull, dance all and the white overproof wars. To his left, Mr. Patrick Hellebaugh, clap him please. Right, the big man around town, you know. Between murder music and gay propaganda, the media debate about homophobic dancehall lyrics in the Jamaican press. And last but not least, a face that we both know. Matter of fact, two faces that we both know well. Donna P. Hope and Livingston White. Applause, applause. <laughs> Your name I mention, a content analysis of media coverage of popular Jamaican music feuds, 1970 to 2010. This should be very, very interesting. Of course you know. We continue these discussions, even beyond this event. So make sure you have your notepads out and your pens in place because we'll be taking questions at the end of the deliberations. So over to Mr. Melvin Cook. Make him welcome. In the spirit of reggae dance hall. Before he starts, as you know, most of, our, most of the um, reggae dance hall events, people tend to crowd to the front because they want to be in the VIP area. So could you, as much as possible, come up to the VIP area, please? So when the camera goes across, you don't see these empty chairs. All right? Step up, step up. Okay, good morning, everybody. In the popular 2010 song, I'm Drinking, DJs Fambo and Beanie Man chortle over a combination of the energy drink and the rum in the refrain, I'm drinking rum and Red Bull. While they do not specify a brand, if the DJs are talking about white overproof rum, by 2010, the prominent Jamaican produced choices had expanded considerably, and since then, there have been more entrants to the market. Up to the mid-2000s, a drink of whites would, almost be, would be almost unquestionably Jerry and Nevy overproof, its market domination dating back to the 1800s. Rum Bar Rum, launched 2007, Street Vibes, launched 2008 and relaunched in July 2012. Rum Fire launched March 2011, and D&G White Overproof launched last July are the new market entrants, along with Conquering Lion, Overproof, Charlie's JB Rum, and Money Musk. This paper analyzes elements of the dancehall-based marketing campaigns conducted by the Jamaican White Overproof from Challengers and Ray and Neville's response to the content of boxing television reality series, Show Me the Ray campaign and Jamaica 50 advertisement. It shows the significance of marketing through dancehall to a product which is rooted in Jamaica's history as a slave plantation and is a world-renowned export. We will not be going back to the PowerPoints for a little while. An extensive part of this presentation is the background to the campaigns, which is essential. So. 
as well. Okay. <laughs> so these campaigns have to be understood in the context of experiential marketing. The confrontation between the coalition of corporate sponsors and dance hall in 2005 and DNG's unilateral withdrawal from sponsoring live events in Jamaica in 2008. These take up the first half of this presentation with analysis of the campaigns constituting the rest in which we will utilize some visuals. In defining experiential marketing, also called experiential branding, which has increased in Jamaica since the late 1990s, it seeks to associate the consumer's values and emotive experiences with a good or service. Nicholas Carver notes that experiential branding is a new strategy for capital accumulation, but it is also situated historically within capital's accumulation of physical, mediated, and social space. Elizabeth Moore says experiential marketing seeks to recast this space as a space of real-time marketing and further notes that the consumer experience itself is increasingly both the object and the medium of brand activity. In general, music works very well for the consumer experience. As Patel says, everyone has some sort of touching experience with music. These experiences are not simply about music itself, but are also linked to other youth concerns with friendships, sexual relationships, and drugs. Hence, utilizing music allows access to a range of emotions which strengthen the experiential marketing campaign. In Jamaica, however, music is, special, is especially suitable to experiential branding. Referencing Deborah Thomas, Horst and Miller underscore the importance of dancehall to the concept of a Jamaican identity, saying the situation in Jamaica is very different since so many people see music as critical to their expressive identity. This music has given corporate entities running experiential branding campaigns a ready-made space which facilitates communication. Dancehall, both as physical and social space for the amplification and consumption of predominantly Jamaican popular music and a music genre of electronically generated rhythms dominated by DJs, which has gained popularity from the 1980s to now be the dominant Jamaican sound is especially suited to experiential marketing. The sound system, now a named assemblage of self-contained sound amplification and playback equipment disseminating primarily Jamaican popular music, is the technological adaptation which led to the creation of recorded Jamaican popular music. It was started not solely for entertainment, but for marketing purposes. Clinton Hutton notes that the sound system did not start out as a commercial entity in its own right but as a marketing tool to attract potential shoppers to an already established business place. For example, Thomas Wong, commonly regarded as the first person to establish a sound system as a commercial enterprise, initially started out playing music at his hardware store for the purpose of attracting potential customers to his hardware establishment. Author Duke Reed also installed his sound system initially to attract, attract potential shoppers to his family bar and liquor store, Treasure Isle. So too Jack Taylor, who owned a hardware store on Orange Street. And Steve Barrow says, essentially mobile discos, the first sound systems were little more than record players with an extension speaker. Liquor store owners especially liked them because they drew crowds to their shops. However, he then expands the sound system's role beyond the obvious commercialization of a store to its own discrete space, as there were numerous other dance halls, most of them called lawns, usually referring to a plot of land owned, and owned by an adjoining bar. The sound would set up inside a fenced-in lawn and begin to play, hoping to draw enough customers through the gate. Inside, drinks and food, curry goat and the like were sold by the promoter who bought from the adjacent bar. In addition to this pattern of liquor consumption established in the earliest stages of what has become Jamaican popular music, in Man Vibes, Hope Marquis identifies the status generating capability of conspicuously consuming various alcoholic drinks in the dance hall space, making it even more attractive to alcoholic beverage providers, including white overproof from makers. Therefore, experiential branding campaigns from the late 1990s to present in Jamaica utilizing dance hall go back to the initial purpose of the sound system, the foundation of Jamaican popular music. However, 
a crucial difference is that while the advertisers and sound system owners were one and the same in the 1950s, the current experiential marketing campaigns are run by corporate entities in collaboration with the owners of cultural capital, the tools, knowledge, and skills required to create and maintain dancehall. Experiential branding takes place in what Cara defines as the brandscape, experiential spaces where cultural practices craft brands and situate them within webs of meaning. Frith introduces power relations, defining the live music brandscape as a particular formation of communicative capital capitalism where the always already commodified live performance in is invested with authentic meaning by the audience. The brandscape is a space that sets out to cultivate and control fans and musicians' ideology of art. I argue that in facilitating the brandscape, dancehall provides its own media, which it has created and maintained to promote itself, initially in the face of limited access to mainstream media. The dancehall poster, which is placed prominently and liberally in public spaces, is dancehall's newspaper, which now provides room for the names and logos of sponsors. Graphic designer Demara McDowell, who, among work for other events, has done the poster for the annual Boxing Day concert sting since 1986, is one of the key players in the advancement of the dancehall poster. He said, I thought that more or less the poster was regular, and if we could get something exciting going, we could build an, on a niche market and excite that niche market and maybe elicit support from other people. It is possible that these improved posters went somewhere towards attracting corporate sponsorship. The sound system is dancehall's radio station. With audio recordings, which are subsequently distributed repeats of the initial broadcast, it is used to broadcast the sponsor's message formally or through the unpaid media of inclusion in song lyrics. The omnipresent video light records the dancehall reality show, which is then distributed through recordings to constitute dancehall's television content. That content now including the banners and dancing girls of corporate sponsors where it exists in the dancehall space. Hence, Hence, dancehall satisfies another requirement of the brandscape. For, as Kara says, branded social space is media dense. It is a mediascape. Dancehall also facilitates ambient advertising, a close relation to experiential marketing in which, Moore says, adverts are placed in everyday spaces rather than conventional advertising media. Advertisements for Jamaican popular music events, especially dancehall, have long been placed liberally in everyday spaces, such as on light posts and walls. Specific to the dancehall phase of Jamaican popular music, unlike the music of the 1970s, in the main, it satisfies a key requirement of experiential branding. Kara says the experiential branding program ultimately has to be filled with banal pedestrian content. Otherwise, it could take on a life of its own. So while the general lack of social commentary in dance or music produced from about the turn of the millennium to present would disturb those who believe that Jamaican popular music has a missionary purpose, apart from lyrics about homosexuality, it is ideal for experiential branding campaigns. This is in contrast to the heavily roots period of Jamaican popular music in the 1970s. In analyzing the lack of sponsorship for pioneering reggae festival Reggae Sun Splash, Taylor Johnston cites Stephen Davis for a Jamaica Tourist Board memorandum dated October 10, 1975, which says, A good part of the attraction of reggae music to its metropolitan audience is its anger and the protest of the lyrics. We obviously face a contradiction between the message of urban poverty and protest which reggae conveys and that of pleasure and relaxation inherent in our holiday product. In short, when we promote reggae music, we are promoting an aspect of Jamaican culture which is bound to draw attention to the harsher circumstances in our lives. All the articles written on the sound so far do this. Our view is that we should leave other agencies and local music interests to carry the ball from here. Operating the brandscape effectively, maintaining the illusion of an authentic musical experience requires a lack of obvious interference. As Kara says, Brands need to appear disinterested when they clearly aren't. The coalition of corporate sponsors' 2005 breaching of this requirement and Red Stripe's unilateral withdrawal of sponsorship of live events in 2008 disrupted the brandscape and are key to the context of the white overproof from marketing campaigns this paper analyzes. 
for the experiential branding campaigns utilizing dancehall are an articulation between capital and dancehall. Stuart Hall defines articulation as the form of the connection that can make a unity of two different elements under certain conditions. It is a linkage which is not necessary, determined, absolute, and essential for all time. Laclaw and Mouffe, I hope, introduced change in the now unified, unified elements in their definition as any practice establishing a relation among elements that their identity is modified as a result of articulatory practice. And Jennifer Slack points out that articulation is then not just a thing, not just a connection, but a process of creating connections, much in the same way that hegemony is not domination, but the process of creating and maintaining consensus of coordinating interests. The 2005 confrontation between the coalition of corporate sponsors and dancehall disrupted this articulation as the sponsors dropped the veil of disinterest, which is crucial to the brandscape. The coalition, Courts Jamaica Limited, Supreme Ventures Digital Red Stripe, the Jamaica Tourist Board, Jerry and Neville, and Cable and Wireless, banned DJs Bounty Killer and Beanie Man after their performances at the Jamaica Carnival Last Hurrah, held at the National Stadium's grounds on April 3, 2005, during which they used curse words, Jamaican curse words, in criticizing homosexuals at the venue. The coalition, which would later also ban Sizza and Phantom Moja, cited breaches of the Town and Communities Act, saying its members would not sponsor acts or events whose live performance endorse or incite violence, demean or discriminate against any person or group of persons. With this statement and the ban, the sponsor shifted from what Robert Parks defines as a commensalistic independent commensalistic interdependence in the ecological perspective on structural functionalism to symbiotic interdependence. The commensalistic situation occurs when two parties' cooperation is in a venture is marked by consensus and communication, while hostility is a feature of symbiotic interdependence. The ban was widely interpreted to be specific to homosexuality, with the profanity used inconveniently. Bounty Killer stated at Reggae Sunsplash in 2006, you know why them ban bounty? Cause my cost batty, man. Me cost more than 3.5 million bad words in a Jamaica already, and I only been charged twice. And them ban, them ban me for bun batty, boy. At the Uptown Monday's first anniversary celebration in June 2005, he dubbed Denos and Geddes, brewers and bottlers of Red Stripe, as Anos and Geddes. This is important. As last July, Bounty Killer was the sole live performer at the launch of D&G White Overproof Rum, held at the Red Stripe head, head office on Spanish Town Road, the same company that banned him seven years ago. So the ban was lifted without concession by the DJs in January 2006. Ronnie Davis, who was then CEO of Cable and Wireless, said we needed to do more negotiations and, that in, and therefore they enter into a phase of corporatism. However, Red Stripe tried the publicly heavy-handed approach one last time in April 2008, announcing it would stop sponsoring live music events in Jamaica. This again was taken as against homosexual lyrics, anti-homosexual lyrics. They went back into the market, staging their own Red Stripe live concert at Sabina Park on March 28, 2009. They pulled the microphone on Assassin when he did the first line of Predis. You know, pre this, how so much fish there, and I don't see this. That resulted in another public brouhaha. So we come to DNG White Overproof Rum, which is their attempt to regain market share, I argue, in the face of declining sales of their products after their withdrawal from live sponsorship of Dancehall. I argue that Dancehall withdrew from Red Stripe and its products, hence, they have had to venture into a new market. And this is the adaptation phase of structural functionalism. So, DNG White Overproof Rum is the most recent of the new White Overproof Rum contenders to Jerry and Neville. It was launched on Friday, July 13th last year. The launch was an immersion in experiential branding, the company transforming part of its sports field into a brandscape. Jamaica's national colors, black, green, and gold, are not only on the bottle, but were used extensively throughout the venue as decor on dancing girls and the stage alike. The stage was set up like a dance hall session, promotional ladies dancing in front of the selectors with the then latest moves, including the 630. At two points in the venue, promotional ladies danced in a raised 
cage-like contraption and staff members were decked out in the promotional attire for the new drink. At the top of the stage ringing, digital signage carried the DNG white overproof from signage. The revolving images came with the encouragement in the language of the streets to call for the crown. The stage was positioned so that the audience was facing the large red stripe lettering on containers at the plant, well behind the, the stage, further reinforcing the brand. The price point, $60 a drink, was reinforced continuously. What was not stated was the objective of embedding DNG White Overproof into the Jamaican culture by the timing of the launch, about three weeks before the country's 50th anniversary of independence, and the use of black, green, and gold in the dance hall setting a precursor to the official street dances which would occur in the independence period. After the session, the action was handed over to Bounty Killer for an hour and a half performance in which he reaffirmed that he would not be bowing to homosexuality. This is at Red Stripe's office. But more importantly, is this gentleman holding the bottle of DNG White Overproof overhead. He held up that bottle for over an hour. The branding is pretty blatant. And then there was Street Vibes Rum, a collaboration between Cartel and his then business partner, Corey Todd, in 2008, which was relaunched last year by Todd during Cartel's unavoidable absence. It is the only Jamaican white overproof rum product which was naturally born into the, ja the dancehall brandscape, as it is the only one of the brands to be owned by an artist, complete with par Cartel's, with Adija Palmer's street name and obviously going after street cred with street in its title. Not surprisingly then, it is interwoven into dancehall lyrics, with Cartel's own street vibes rum becoming a dub plate, where he says, party get drastic, get some street vibes rum from Todd Quick. Everywhere we party, people want to know why the Gaza man so happy. Street vibes rum as much as me mix up in a cup. In raving, popcorn DJs, yell them fat, one bad when the two them drop, one just drop and bust our head back when Street Vibes run bust up in our head top. Cartel also started Street Vibes Thursdays, a dance hall event at the building, which he was in control of at the time, and it comes complete with the dancing girls. And then there is Rum Fire, produced by Hamden Estates in Trelawney. This is an interesting one. It was launched in 2011 and immediately went after the dance hall market in two very striking ways, apart from the normal party sponsorship. One was that it did a rhythm, the Rum Fire Rhythm, which premiered at Sting 2011, which it also sponsored heavily. So at one point at Sting 2011, it becomes an infomercial. There's a DJ on stage with Rum Fire on the backdrop, and they're talking about this product and launching it in the dance hall space. This is in addition to the branding on the bar area, the entrance, and the technical booth. Rum Bar Rum has gone after its dance on marketing in a very aggressive way. One of its most important sponsorships is the Chug It Party in Portmore, renowned for its consecutive performances by Bounty Killer and Tom Lee Sparta last year during the height of their brouhaha. At that event, it is conveniently put at the top of the drink list. And finally, we take a look at the reigning champion, and for some time undisputed white rum overproof champion, Jerry and Neville. Its status as a white soft choice in dance hall is underscored by its mention in lyrics, such as Tanya Stevens in Cherry Brandy, when she asks, you think me, have, you think me drinking is a problem, F you then. My best friend and Miss Aria and him Neville them. And they have gone into the boxing world with their calendar on the Show Me The Ray campaign. And interestingly, they sponsor the Contender Series, a live reality middleweight boxing series, which took Jamaica's, well, caught our attention and led in some way to the rumbling Jamrock fight with Nicholas Walters for the world title last year, at which Sizzler, once a band man by a coalition which included Jerry and Neville, performed and did a dub plate for Jerry and Neville on stage after leading Walters on stage. This translates to Sting 2012, where Sizzler introduces Walters to the crowd on stage and the clash at Sting to climax last year's event, 
which took place in a boxing ring. Unlike the one at Rumbling Jam Rock, it was branded by Downsound Records, Sting's sponsor, and not Ray and Neville. And the boxing belts are prominent at Sting. Here we see Ninja Man wearing the overall title with Walters, and Kiprich raising the belt as the now Sting champion. Hence, in wrapping up, the white rum overproof wars take place in the context of the brandscape. But those who participate in it, including two companies which were once members of the coalition of corporate sponsors, which banned DJs Bounty Killer and Sizzler, have had to come to terms with them many times on their own terms. Um, ascertaining which one is most successful at this point, we don't have any figures right now. Street feedback would indicate that Rome Fire is making some headway, that Street Vibes is basically not good, and Rome Bar is also making some profits. Thank you. Well, we have to always give a big up for these um, intellectual discourses that follow what we consider our love and our passion to promote Jamaica's music. At this point, I'd like to invite of our only foreign um, panelist here today, Mr. Patrick Helber, to give us his 20-minute um, presentation on Between Murder Music and Gay Propaganda, the media debate about homophobic dancehall lyrics in the Jamaican press. Put your hands together for him, please. Yeah, first of, first of all, thank you very much for the nice introduction and yeah, thank you to Dr. Donna Hope for making this conference possible and for also getting me deeper into dancehall culture. <laughs> um, okay, I may, will make this a little bit. Okay. Um, since the early 1990s, Jamaican dancehall music has been constantly criticized, and we had this in Mel Cook's presentation already um, today, um, to promote homophobia and also nationally to incite violence and encourage vulgar behavior. In 2004, um, a campaign organized by the British... Can I put this a little bit lower? Like this. Okay, that's better. Sorry. Um, in 2004, a campaign organized by the British-based LGBTI organization, Outrage and its Jamaican equivalent, JFLEG, labeled dancehall music, murder music, and led to boycotts and concert cancellations in North America and Europe. The heavy reactions on the international LGBTI communities and their supporters reflected the issue of anti-homosexual contents in Jamaican popular music back to the back to the island and resulted in a huge media controversy. The controversy, which focused on homophobic and violence inciting lyrics, was mainly battled in the Jamaica Cleaner, the Jamaica Observer, and the Jamaica Star. There it provided the ground for a large discussion about the negotiation of Jamaican cultural identity forged between post-coloniality and transnationality. My presentation today underlines the important role of popular culture in the process of shaping a collective Jamaican cultural identity in the 21st century. It further highlights the importance of respectability and outlines how crucial elements of the respectable state are in crisis because of a var variety um, because of a variety of social, cultural political and economical changes which happened in the second half of the 20th century. The cultural anthropologist Deborah Thomas summarizes this as follows. When the hegemony of the respectable state has been threatened, what often emerges is a discourse that foregrounds a sense of crisis rather than one that acknowledges or celebrates a particular kind of liberation. 
Thomas quotes emphasizes the hegemony of the respectable state, which is under threat. She refers to a long time dominant concept of the Jamaican Creole multiracial state, which has been challenged through what Deborah Thomas describes as modern blackness. She defines modern blackness as urban, migratory, based on youth-oriented popular culture, and influenced by, Amer by African-American popular style, individualist, and radically consumerist, and also ghetto feminist. She further points out a struggle for public representation uh, public representational power between dancehall music, um, the strongest element of popular culture, and what she's calling the respectable state. The origin of the respectable state lays in the unification of the two Jamaicas, um, which needed a common cultural identity on the way to the country's independence in 1962. The task was to bring together the offspring of the former slaveholders and the marginalized masses of the black people, which have been divided through race, color, and political power from the 17th century on until the 1940s. In this formation process of national identity, the elites of the Creole multiracial state focused on selected parts of folk culture of the rural population and excluded urban popular culture elements of the working class. The so their solution was to emphasize a Jamaican identity which focused highly on a nation on the concept of nation and ignoring the concept of race. This was summarized through the Jamaican national motto out of many one people which constructs Jamaicanness in a way which is based on national identity and more or less neglects blackness and the racial identity of the population. It further, I think, blurs the rigid class structure, ongoing racial discrimination and gender inequality which are crucial parts of the post-colonial Jamaican national state. The concept of respectability Played a very played, the concept of respectability played a very important part in the formation process of the Creole multiracial state and its cultural identity. It links the ideas of Christianity, nuclear family, traditional gender roles, with the man as the breadwinner and the woman as the housewife, and heterosexuality, and um, education as necessary elements to gain progress and, to ex and more or less to get an access to modernity. Its maintenance, as I mentioned already, furthers also uh, or plays an important role in the argumentation against homosexuality and other practices considered as sexually deviant, as for example oral sex, which we heard in a presentation this morning. Um, the policing of respectability has a long history, which goes back until colonialism and plantation slavery. Since the beginning of colonialism, the difference between colonizers and colonized was maintained through sexual control, which also plays an important part in the concept of respectability. And I just put this picture because it shows so nice um, heterosexuality and the couple, and also the policing with a guy from, um, I, I think it's King Alarm. <laughs> um, the hegemony of the respectable state feels, maintain, feels mainly threatened through the intersection of transnational international and local influences, the transnational support for civil society organizations, and the constant movement of people and products from popular culture between Jamaica and North America and the UK can be considered as an example which eroded borders and opened the Jamaican national state more and more to what is perceived by many Jamaicans as dangerous foreign influences. The strong campaign against homophobia in dancehall music was considered as one of these threatening transnational aspects. It was often perceived in Jamaica as an attempt and sometimes even as a crusade to turn the country by force, quote, into a nation of gay-loving people, end of quote. Mark Wignall talks in a commentary in the Jamaica Observer about homosexuals which are forcing themselves into our collective consciousness and ultimately into our living rooms especially the availability of US television and productions of popular culture are often perceived as vehicles which carry transgressions like homosexuality into the Jamaican society. In letters to the editorials of the two big daily newspapers, the Jamaican Cleaner and the Jamaica Observer, um, letters which came from Jamaicans living in Jamaica but also from abroad, um, the um, they turned against the campaign and asked um, the organizations um, more or less to stay out of the national business, business of Jamaica. The international campaign 
were mainly perceived as an attempt to force Jamaicans with economic and political pressure, and the economic pressure was also mentioned, mentioned by Mel Cook a little bit, um, which forced them political pressure to accept sexual practices which they didn't perceive as a part of their national identity and culture. In this context, it is important to mention that not only Jamaicans perceived homosexuality so, um, not, not only Jamaicans perceived homosexuality as something completely un-Jamaican, but also white LGTBI organizations, as for example Outrage, constructed an image of black queers or queers of color as completely outside of their original culture which was perceived as essentially homophobic and hostile due to a lack of modernity. This is, for example, visible in a statement done by Outrage's voice, um, Peter Tetchel, and I quote um, from one of his um, publications on his webpage, in recent years, more than 30 gay men have been killed in Jamaica. They have died horrible, gruesome death at the hands of homophobic mobs. Um, it is like Afghanistan under the Taliban. Queers are stoned to death, chopped up with machines, beaten unconscious with sticks, dozened with petrol and set ablaze, blasted in the head with shotguns and chased into the sea until they drown from exhaustion. Um, yeah, this kind of reproaches can be read in a neo-colonial struggle where attitudes like homophobia and sexism are perceived as essential aspects of the culture of the other. Through comparing Jamaica with Afghanistan and labeling the country as the most homophobic place on earth, which happens in the, happened in the Time magazine, um, discourses, discursive borders reassured the colonial division between modernity and backwardness. A letter to the editorial in The Gleaner put this in a nutshell, and I quote, in dubbing Jamaica homophobic, our country is being stigmatized as abnormally intolerant towards gays without any real supporting evidence. Besides foreign influences and homosexuality, the locally and transnationally influenced phenomena of dancehall provided a serious other threat to the respectable state. Dancehall confronted the hegemony of the Creole multiracial state through urban popular expressions of blackness that had been marginalized within the cultural policy designed at the independence. The dancehall culture creates a countercultural space in which black identity and solidarity are practiced and a female empowerment carried out through what scholars like Caroline Cooper um, describe as erotic marunage. Within the dancehall space, the concept of respectability is challenged. Instead, respect is paid usually to marginalized black people from the working class. Just to exemplify this, I have a quote from Maka Diamond's novel, Bon Him, um, about a character called Mitzi, and it says, she may have been 35 with, the, with three children and had more baby father drama than a soap opera, but Mitzi still considered herself to the hottest thing since jerk chicken. Then again, it wasn't as, as if she was lying to herself, because in all aspects, she was who she was, a Bashman girl of the highest order. So in this quote, we can basically see how um, women from working class, black women from working class, get respect in the dance hall, which they wouldn't get probably because of their baby father drama, like a soap opera, um, in the broader society. Outside, um, dance hall also takes a very ambivalent position in the social, cultural, and political struggles in Jamaica. On one hand, the music subverts respectability and the uh, Creole multiracial state through its provocations and its vociferous celebrations of urban blackness and sexuality. But on the other hand, it also reinforces um, respectability through what the scholar Dennis Noble describes and I quote, um, the reproduction of compulsory heterosexuality as a key signifier of post-colonial blackness. Um, the social, cultural, economic, political transformations within Jamaica produced doubts and uncertainties regarding the future. The popular talk show host Ian Boyne argued in an article commenting violence at Sting in 2004, um, I quote, the degeneracy is from top to bottom. Sections of the capitalist classes are also irresponsible, morally bankrupt, and philosophically nihilistic. Um, there, the, ins the uncertainties and transitions created a discourse in the public print media, which was shaped around the central aspects of dissolving and deviance in several layers, not only of the Jamaican society, but also of the Western world. And then again, the decay of the Western world is 
considered as a part of Jamaican's crisis because transnational links are perceived as threatening influences, as I showed before, which enter the Jamaican society. We can find this, for example, in an article in the Jamaica Observer in 2004 called The New Gay World Order, and I quote, I realize that what we are seeing is the ever-expanding borders of human degeneration, where absolutely anything goes, and where people with a sense of degeneracy are being goaded into silence. The, cri the crisis discourse I'm talking about designs a very morbid picture of Jamaica, which is often drawn in articles targeting dancehall and homosexuality. The Jamaican society, and especially the inner cities, are described in this discourse as dysfunctional, sick, or Ivan, Iron Boy even called it once a time bomb. Okay, I was talking about this crisis discourse and will now explain what is um, the effect of this crisis discourse. I argue that the construction of the crisis bears the effect of a discursive reinforcement of what I described before as respectability. The urge for respectability is emphasized in the discourse on popular culture and homosexuality. This happens through four different discourses. Um, the first discourse puts a strong emphasis on the Christian Bible and the importance of Christian values for the Jamaican society. Its connection with the popular culture is obvious in the following quote. Butcher was right, this is a quote from a newspaper article. Butcher was right when he sang Boom Bye Bye. In spite of the uproar that caused him to refine or recant his original message, the lyrics may have been harshly but clearly spoke figuratively about riding Jamaica of the nasty sex habits. Butcher was also right in his following up song that pointed to Leviticus as the Jamaican cultural standard on homosexuality. The plea to the Bible as a moral guideline is further inherent in the common figurative expression God make Adam and Steve im Namek Adam and uh, God make Adam and Eve im Namek Adam and Steve, which appears in various articles. Um, through the reference to the biblical creation, the second discourse, which carries out the naturalization of heterosexuality comes into play. This discourse forces Jamaica as a strict, strict heteronormative society and condemns homosexuality as an unacceptable moral transgression and a sin. It contributes to the discourse on respectability because it defines a rigid imagination of sexuality, which happens between a male and a female, figuratively expressed in the following commentary from the Jamaica Observer. Most importantly, we do not want a uh, quote. Most importantly, we do not want a mountain of crusade in our society acculturated into a belief that male-male sex is sinful, sick, and a lion to a nation of people who have bought into the idea that a vagina is a penis best friend, end of the quote. Sexuality is constructed as an activity which is less linked to individual pleasure but to re reproduction and to ensure the survival of the human civilization. The third aspect is the policing of respectability through the verbal condemnation or restrictions against vulgarity and sexually explicit practices in dancehall culture. Ian Boyne labels, for example, the dancehall show Sting as annual vulgar orgy, um, where Jamaicans only go because they want to hear Lady Saw and the brook out, skin out female artists who can be described their anatomical makeup. He also talks about dancehall artists as promoters of anarchy and vulgarity. Respectability is further reinforced when criticisms target the objectification and the demeaning of women and the celebration of the penis as a weapon in dancehall culture. The fourth part of the discourse is that respectability is maintained through a strict distinction between high and low culture, which constructs dancehall as generally valueless and a threat to society. In this discursive strand, cultural practices of the working class like dancehall are excluded because they are neither presentable nor respectable. Mark Wignall, for example, denies the cultural value of dancehall and states. Brought up in a time when lyricists were royal, royalty, Elvis was king, Sinatra was chairman of the board, Nat King Cole was the smoothest and chess was the soul which kept them all alive. It is difficult for people like me to listen to even two minutes of American hip-hop or 20 seconds of an Elephant Man song. 
or 20 seconds of Elephant Man. The quote demonstrates how Vignal excludes certain parts of black urban popular culture from what he perceives as valuable or respectable cultural products. It seems that only chess or rock and roll bear for him valuable intellectual content, which he argues lacks dancehall music and its supporters. And I have another quote from him. Quite apart from the fact that, DJs, that the DJs have neither the brains nor the social responsibility acumen to deal with criticisms such as mine, what gals me is that they insist that they are giving the people what they want. What this means is they feed the people with crap. End of quote. The lack of social responsibility can also be considered as a lack of respectable behavior which is related to education and appropriate parlance, behavior and style. Dance or culture is perceived as an inferior cultural practice which insists of promoting respectability which instead of promoting respectability supports tendencies of dissolution through the propaganda of the wrong role models like for example the shotter, the don or a drug dealer. And I conclude very fast. <laughs> um, the public debate on dancehall music and homophobia provided a ground for a large debate on Jamaican cultural identity. With this debate, which was originally caused through transnational activities of LGBTI organizations, Jamaicans on the island and in the diaspora expressed a discourse of crisis which blamed the decay and illusion of constitutional values and morals for the Jamaican society. Respectability was reinforced through a medial discourse which focused on four central aspects. First, the emphasis of Christian morals and values. Second, the maintenance of heteronormativity through testing homosexuality as biologically abnormal. Third, the rejection of urban popular culture as vulgar and slack. And through excluding the urban working class like it happened in the nation building process which led to the formation of the Creole multiracial state in 1962. Um, Dancehall itself adopts a highly ambivalent position in this whole discussion because it subverts on one hand um, colonial respectability through the uh, glorification of slackness and um, all the emp emancipative moments I mentioned before, but on the other hand uh, still reinforces heteronormativity which forms a central part of the respectable colonial citizen as well. Thank you very much. Well, this, this is a space for intellectual discourse. So um, the views that you hear, you discuss them. And um, if you're in agreement, you're in agreement. If you're not, then you discuss them as we continue. Put your hands together again for Mr. Helber. <laughs> so our third presenters, our team, Dr. Donna P. Hope will come first. And then she'll be followed by Dr. Livingston White. Your topic, your name, I mention a content analysis of media coverage of popular Jamaican music feud between 1970 and 2010. Put your hands together for them. Thank you, Dr. White, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. No. Oh, dear. Thank you, Dr. White. I think that, that works. Testing. testing, testing, yes. All right, I don't want to. Thank you, Dr. White, yes. All thank right, you, thank you. you. And this is a joint presentation, guys. Uh, Dr. White has decided to take on the technical work this morning, so we're allowing him that luxury. This presentation is a joint presentation specifically because it actually comes out of a joint piece of research that Dr. White and myself are conducting. We started conducting it last, last summer um, in July out of research funds from the Principal's Research Awards Initiative. 
um, we are looking and we decided to conduct this piece of research, media and popular culture, particularly because of some of the activities that have been very common in Jamaican dance hall and the integral relationship that exists between that kind of activity and the media, very important activity. And so we decided to do a content analysis. The name of the, um, of the paper um, that we are presenting is really from a year name I mentioned. No bother fret now worry your intention. It comes from Megaband and Song, which translated really means no publicity is bad publicity. Once you name a call, it's all good. Whether or not it's negative publicity or it's good publicity, in PR we understand publicity to be something that is very good. And so we are going to do our presentation in two parts this morning. I will talk a little bit about the backgrounding to the paper and Dr. White will give us some of the stats and we'll give you some of our preliminary findings. We are doing some more work and we'll be continuing the work and wrapping up the, the work um, in two more months so we'll have a final report that gives you a broader synopsis of what we have captured. So we talk about, um, in our paper, we look at the origins of dancehall, where dancehall came from, um, its relationship to Jamaican reggae music, and one of the things that we find in doing our work that a lot of the analyses on dancehall culture come from the early work of individuals who write in the print media, in the electronic media, and so many of us who started doing our early work had to draw on the resources from the Gleaner and the Star. People like Melville Cook, who is over there to my right, has provided a lot of information for scholars like myself because of the documenting of dance hall activities, dance hall feuds, dance hall everything in the newspapers prior to it becoming something that was seen as useful for academic inquiry. And I talk about this in my first book, In the Dance Hall. Now, the paper and the research specifically comes out of the excitement, a lot of it generated, we think, through media, the Gully Gaza excitement that became something very big in Jamaica and which, in a sense, took dancehall feuds and popular music feuds to another level. It brought it to a level that while dancehall feuds and that kind of clash culture has been always an integral part of the competitive nature, lyrically, of dancehall, and of Jamaican music, the dancehall feud that um, escalated between Vibes Cartel, um, Gaza, and Mavada, Gully, in 2009, 2008, 9, and beyond, escalated in a, to a different level that created a lot of attention, a lot of media furor, and a lot of debate and dialogue around the issue and seen, as I said, very differentiated from what usually occurred between artists and or supporters of artists in dancehall and in popular music. No major work has been done to capture the configuration of these artist to artist engagements in Jamaican music culture. What we have had are discussions and attempts to sort of talk around it, to theorize around it, to criticize it, and to say things about it, good or bad. And so we decided to do some scientific research around this issue to see what we could find, particularly about the media activity around these issues to provide some critical insight on trends in the music industry as well as to allow the society, broadly speaking, researchers, students, journalists and others to understand dance hall feuds. We also wanted to provide a point of reference for future recurrences of dance hall feuds, popular music feuds, and also to try and offer what we call a historical review of dance hall feuds by providing content analysis of the Jamaica's media coverage over the period of 1970 to 2010. We also wanted to address the reactions to dancehall feuds, especially the Gully Gaza feud, which is one of the more recent and very explosive and very expansive popular music feuds that developed around dancehall culture and around Jamaican popular music. And so this work um, draws on different sources, but particularly we have spent a great deal of time looking at newspaper sources, a significant, we have developed a significant archive of newspaper resources. Um, we have found newspapers going as far back as the 1970s that capture and engage with dancehall feuds. So we have a massive archive of newspapers, some of them no longer in print, 
that we have developed around popular music feuds and very interesting themes are coming out. We did a, a, a literature review trying to pull together important literature. Again, many of the literature that we have found are based in newspaper articles and a few conference presentations. Some of them took place at the last international reggae conference. We actually had a panel because of what was happening at that time. That was in 2010. And so we had a panel with people talking about the Gully Gaza clash. Individuals like Michael Barnett, Annie Paul, Kim Marie Spence, Sonia Stanley Nye and others looked at their research at the 2010 International Reggae Conference as a kind of initial attempt to provide academic attention to that feud. They spoke more specifically about the Movado and cartel infarction, even while, um, for example, Michael Barnett went further back to look at some of the feuds that existed in Jamaican popular music and what he talked about, some of the earlier feuds that characterized the tone and the tenure of Jamaican popular music and the high levels of competition that existed. So for example, it looks at the talked about and the literature review looks at this. The um, relationship between, for example, Cox and Dodd and Duke Creed and the kind of real clashes that would take place between their systems, sound systems, that would provide the energy for some of the um, lyrical sparring and the dance sparring that would take place in Jamaican popular music at that early time. We also have a study by, done by one a graduate student from Carrimac, McCarthy, who did a pilot study into some early work to try and, and in a sense, analyze the feuds, the Cartel Movado feud in Jamaica's mainstream media. We, our theoretical framework, we particularly use agenda setting function of the media because based on what we have found so far, um, there is a significant amount of agenda setting that goes on around these feuds and around dancehall culture. We, we are looking, so we look at who sets the public agenda versus who sets the media agenda. First level agenda setting the issue of salience, what the issues are that you are encouraged to think about and talk about. And of course, second level agenda setting, attribute salient, how to think about these issues. And so one of the things, and I'm going to break here for Dr. White to go into detail about some of the findings of the content analysis, but several themes have been emerging. And so, for example, um, I have isolated from the sample of newspaper articles, all the newspaper articles about Sting. And these are since the early 1980s and Mr. McDowell is here with us. Sting gets a lot of free publicity from the media. They don't have to pay for it because of the organic nature of dancehall culture and Sting and the Jamaican media. The media begins its free publicity around Sting in about October, November, and starts to energize with clashes and the discussions and the war, continues into the November and December, and continues into January. And Sting, in a sense, becomes a very important site of energy for our newspapers, all of them, and there are individuals who spend a lot of time pulling out issues, and if there's a clash that is being set up or staged, then that becomes a discussion. People are interviewed, things are plugged, and Sting gets a lot of free publicity. Sting's name is, being, is always mentioned in various ways. I have a huge bulk of material that points to this as a theme, one of the themes that we'll be pulling out in the broader study the qualitative theme, as well as some of the other things that we'll be looking at. We'll also be looking at um, video, um, video footage, for example, from popular programs like Entertainment Report and others to see what we can find, again, coding from, from those programs for our content analysis. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Dr. Livingston White, who is going to give us some of the scientific data that he has found, that we have found from the content analysis of the newspapers that we have coded so far. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donna Hope. <laughs> so Donna has given you the background to the study. Uh, we've been working on this for about the past two years. In my part of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit to the methodological design of the study and then share some preliminary findings with you. That's my way of saying that the study is not done, okay? <laughs> we still have more work to do. So what we're sharing with you this morning uh, are the findings from the analysis of the newspaper component. As Donna pointed out, we plan to do an analysis of the television reports done on dancehall feuds over the years. So as you've heard, the, the method we've used is a content analysis 
of course, this is not the only method that we will be using in the overall study because when you're testing agenda setting, one of the things you do uh, is that you try to find what the content is, but you also need to find what the reaction is to the content. And for this study, what we're doing, if I go back to the previous slide, if you notice, we're looking at first level agenda setting and second level agenda setting. Uh, the content analysis will allow us to and so the first part of this um, agenda setting framework. So what issues to think about? The content analysis will allow us to describe those issues. But when we look at how to think about those issues now, the content analysis can help there as well. And uh, McCombs and Shaw, the authors of this uh, particular framework, they, they've said in a recent article, well, written in the 90s, that you know, agenda setting research has moved from just focusing on looking at who sets the public agenda. We also want to find out who sets the media agenda. And so for that reason, we're going to be doing some interviews with journalists as well, you know, the gatekeepers, the editors. So we're trying to test this framework in its entirety and not just look at the content side of things, but look at the reaction. Ideally, it would be nice to go and do audience surveys as well to find out how Jamaican audiences feel about the media's coverage, but I don't think that can be covered in our budget. That's for future research. So for now, what we're trying to do is to describe the content and understand the journalist's approach to, to covering uh, dancehall feuds. One of the things you'll hear about content analysis is that it aims to be objective. And we know that we really can't achieve true objectivity here. We have to acknowledge the subjectivity that exists. And this is why I point out the different types of content we code. You have manifest content, which is easy to code because it's just on the surface. You see it there, the name of the newspaper, you can't go wrong with that. But when we start asking the coders to make interpretations about the content. We're getting into what we call latent content now. And Potter and others who've done uh, work on the content analysis methodology, they describe two types of latent content. You have pattern content and projective content. And in this study, we looked at those types of content too because some of the codes, some of the variables we were asking the coders to look at involved uh, making a judgment about the story. So do you think the story is sensationalized? Uh, what's the tone of the story? Is it negative, positive? So the coder would have to read that story now and make a judgment, and that is based on their own subjective interpretation of what they feel is positive, what they feel is negative. So we incorporated some of that pattern and projective content in the analysis. So it's not just an objective analysis we're looking at. We're, we're allowing some amount of subjectivity to get in there. Now another way we try to look at the methodology and talk about its reliability is we check for something called intercoder reliability. You know, our findings will only be deemed as reliable if we can show to you that there is some high level of agreement among the coders. In this particular uh, study, we had seven coders. Some of them are here this morning. I invited them to the presentation. So I have seven graduate students coding the content. And so we had to train them, you know, in how to identify the content, how to interpret it, how to judge the content. And then we had to now calculate uh, intercoder reliability, the level of agreement. This is a number you get, a coefficient that tells you how much they agree. And what we did in this study, we did a pre-intercoder reliability check and a post-intercoder reliability check. So before the bulk of the coding started, we got 40 articles and have the seven coders code the 40 articles and then at the end of the bulk of the coding where they all did about 80 articles each we did another 40 overlap so the purpose of this overlap is to check for intercoder reliability agreement and what we found is that in the initial phases in the initial phases uh, the reliabilities were from about 0.6 to 1. Uh, don't be frightened by this number. What it means, 1 is perfect agreement, 0 is no agreement. So 0.6 to 1, it's fairly good. Eh? Uh, we got about three perfect reliabilities the first round, but at the end, we would expect to get more perfect reliabilities. And we saw about 10 instances of perfect agreement. So they improved over time, and that's what I wanted to show. And we saw that um, with our intercoder reliability coefficients. Some of the variables that were low in the initial phase uh, got higher at the end of the coding. Uh, so we've done 700 articles, actually 702 to be specific. Uh, this was collected over last summer in 2012, a three-month archive search. And of course, we have work to be completed, which I mentioned. So let's get to the findings. Yeah? Uh, 
We looked at the frequency of coverage by newspaper, and as you can see here, the star has the highest. And uh, just for those of you who don't know, the star is our tabloid, our tabloid um, evening paper published by the Gleaner Company, which is also a long-standing newspaper we have in Jamaica. And they go after most of the entertainment type content. So you'd expect to see the dance hall feuds being covered in the star. So that is not unusual, that's expected. When we look at the day of the week uh, with the frequency of coverage, most of the stories appeared on a Friday. You know, you got about 28% stories coming out on the Friday. Again, for the weekend, you tend to have the entertainment content coming out on the weekend, so that's not surprising. Um, still would like to know what's happening on a Tuesday, though, with uh, 102 coming out on the Tuesday. But one could also think um, it's a slow day, and the events would have happened over the weekend. So any review of a... Uh, a, a, a dance hall show that happened on a Saturday night or a Sunday. It's likely to happen on maybe the Monday or the Tuesday coming out after the weekend, okay? So that could explain why we're seeing another high figure on the Tuesday. Now, the study covers the period 1970 to 2010. And when we were doing our searches, you know, the students were quite frustrated. Sir, we're not finding anything in the 70s. But I deliberately wanted to look at a period when you would not find a lot of stories to be able to compare it to a period when you would find a lot of stories. And the year of note here is 2009. And we all know what was happening in 2009 the gully Gaza feud. So of course it's not surprising that we're seeing the highest number of um, stories coming out in that year. I started the table from 1995 because prior to this you'd get about two stories, three stories and so on and, and they weren't showing up to be any meaningful um, percentage. You'd get like zero percent and so on. So 2009 is the year to watch. But you can see um, another reason for seeing so many stories coming out in the mid-90s is that we had an expansion of the media environment. Um, the Daily Observer, um, the other major newspaper, came out in around the 90s. So you would expect to see more coverage of dance hall fields because we now had more channels. Okay, so that's something to watch with this particular slide. Now, we looked at the characteristics of the headlines. Just to explain this particular table to you, we divided the newspaper page into six by three, 18 cells, and asked the coders to shade the area of the newspaper where you'd find a headline appearing. So you notice that we have the highest percentages appearing at the top. So that's the top of the page. So yes, most of the headlines were positioned towards the top of the page. That's a position of prominence again, not to the lower section or the middle section of the page. Um, so that's something to watch for there in terms of the prominence attached to the stories when they're placed in the newspaper. The type of article. Uh, lots of them were news, uh, some were editorials, as you can see, feature articles and so on. So we did quote for this. You had some opinion pieces as well, letters to the editors and so on. Um, but most were news uh, features, news articles. In terms of byline, we were looking at whether or not the story carried an identified uh, author, writer. And we can see that a lot of them had that attribution. You know, some were contributed mostly by the publicists. Some of them had no byline, no clear author indicated. But we're very interested in this because these journalists that we've identified, we plan to go back to talk to them now, you know, and sit with them and the articles to say what was going on when you wrote this and so on. Yes, there are issues of recall, but we're going to try to jog their memories to see what they remember from the period covering the feuds and so on. Uh, this is one of the uh, variables where, you know, we depended on the coders to make a judgment, you know, a value judgment. And uh, the coders concluded that, you know, about 27% of the stories were sensationalized. We did leave some room for, you know, uncertainty. And so they were unsure about some. But as you can see, most of the stories were judged as not being sensationalized. Okay, so they were just factual, straight news stories. Tone of the stories, another subjective category here. Uh, notice here, negative is higher than the positive coding, both negative and positive, but a lot of them were neutral again. So when we link this to the debate that's going on out there, it said, oh, the media caused this, and the media caused it, and the media frame it in such a way. When you start looking at the content analysis and judging how the media are covering the issue, you suddenly realize that maybe we shouldn't be blaming the media so much in this particular instance when it comes to the coverage of dance or feuds. Uh, we also looked at pictures, a uh, couple of slides left. Uh, many of the stories carried pictures, over 82% carried pictures. Uh, most of the pictures were single pictures, 
and again you know there were pictures relating to just showing the headshots of the artists and so on um some newspapers were creative and they did the montage of some artists and some scenes from performances but most of the stories carried pictures uh, again, we also looked at the photographers, the photo attribution, if they had an identified photographer. Because in that interview process we're going to do, we'd also like to talk to some of the photographers, journalists and photographers, and so on. So that's, that's it in a nutshell for some preliminary findings. In terms of future research, as we're saying, this is an ongoing study. We hope to publish a book out of this. Yes, Donna? <laughs> because we have a, a lot of data, you know, and that was a, the reason for us going into this research. You know, there's a lot of emotional debate surrounding it, but we don't have the facts to back up the emotions. And so we're trying to present this scientific uh, examination of how the media covers uh, feuds in Jamaica. So we're hoping that this will help to have the Jamaican society understand the feud. So when we have feuds occurring in the future, we probably won't see a repeat of what happened with the Gully Gaza phenomenon where everybody got on the bandwagon and was very emotional about the good and the bad and what it's causing in society and so on. We can actually stand back and say, hey, when feuds happen, these are the trends we notice. This is how the media choose to cover it and so on. And we can have more informed discussions. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. That was brilliant. What do you think? What do you think? It was brilliant? Well, put your hands together again. <laughs> e. Cordell. <laughs> yes. But this area of content analysis in, the, in this way, they the broke it down, really touched home with me because I served as a, as, as a design in the journalism department, designer in the journalism department, and um, many of what they said, pretty much the way we approached it, to capture the public's interest in a certain kind of way. So, congrats for discovering some of our secrets. Um, we have 10 minutes of question and answer. And um, there's a roaming mic right here. Oh, but there's one there. So, um, could you just queue up? It's only 10 minutes, maybe about eight minutes left. And um, feel free to ask you to field your questions. Is it on? No, it's not on. It's not Mr. On. Soundman, could you? Ron, today, can you hear me? Okay, speak. I have um, two questions. The, um, the, my first question, my first question to the last set of presenters, that um, in terms of your, you know, come for that one. No, this one, not, this one not. Testing. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Oh, still not on. No, it's on. Anyway, I'll go and use this one all the same. We'll just sit here. It's on, Rob. It's on now. It's on now. <laughs> Can I finally go now? Yes. <laughs> yes, finally. Just um, to the last two presenters, that is Donna and um, Livingston White. Uh, it would have been interesting also in your research if you also include um, other Caribbean islands yes, and, and not be ridiculous in terms of how they view the same thing to see whether we are just different because I, I was in Dominica recently and they had the same thing with respect to a feud between a particular Calypsonian um, but this was now with the rest of the Calypsonians and how it was presented on the media and how it was presented in other places in the media. So it will be interesting to see if their approach is similar to ours or is it that it's a media approach um, rather than a Jamaican media approach. Yeah. That one. Now the, the, um, the gentleman who had presented just before you, um, Idle, got his name? Patrick. Idle? Patrick. Patrick. Yes, with respect to um, the, the same homophobic um, perception of Jamaica, one of the things that um, one of the things that always come to the fore is perception. In terms of we get within the same country, um, different people highlighting the same things differently. One of the things that we get in Jamaica is people saying that we are very homophobic, but we do not have the empirical evidence to prove that we are very homophobic. 
one or two incidents doesn't make um, an entire summer, really. And so it is important that we look at the things in context. Um, I can come to you and say that something is, um, is bad, very bad, but I just used two examples that is very bad. That doesn't make it entirely bad for the country. So in terms of the perception, it's important to look at where it is coming from and if there are any hidden agendas, why it is portrayed in that way. Just that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those suggestions about the looking at other Caribbean islands. I like it in that it will shift the focus from just dancehall and we can be looking at feuds in popular music, not only dancehall but calypso and see if the trends are similar. Okay? And so it's not, we won't be saying then it's a, a phenomenon peculiar to Jamaica only, but you find it elsewhere in the Caribbean. Okay? But we'd also find whether it's really the media um, really that agenda setting you know activity yeah. if it's really a media activity yes, Patrick, are you responding to the comment? No. Oh, all right. hello Hi, um, in reference to the media um, to in me. reference to the media um, propagation of dancehall feuds I find that in reference to the time period chosen from the 1970s to present time, you left out social media and modern technology as it relates to driving that um, sensa sens sensationalism of the feuds and what's going on. I didn't hear any of that, and I think that's a very important well, aspect. Um, and, and I suppose that would refer, refer to the period, particularly after, say, 2002, when social media becomes very common. Yeah. Um, we are trying to first work with traditional media because they would have had a longer standing relationship with the culture. They would have been through the early stages and into the current era. And again, the, the um, resources that we have in the study, if we can get additional resources, then we will extend the study to capture some of the forms of social media activity that we know have been very important so funding is also an important part of the activity well I, me I meant it in the sense of social media pushing the media itself to look at things the, the in that yeah. okay. okay. a part of the challenge yes yeah, so the social media influence in the media the traditional media to push the issue uh, a challenge there is that we're going to have to see if a lot of the content out on social media is archived and it's to find it to go back and look at it you see some of this research then what you're suggesting we'd have to do it in real time and be collecting the data as it's happening but it's a good suggestion for future research and if there are other popular feuds in the future we would be sure to then capture social media content as it's happening so that we can incorporate it into the analysis but thanks for the suggestion good any other questions from yeah. the floor. Um, I have two questions. The first one is from Mel Cook. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about the influence that um, this corporate culture has on the dance hall. I mean, um, as someone from North America, there is this sort of general sense that uh, the consumer sort of does the bidding of the corporation because of the advertising. You know, it's advertised, so, you know, they say $60 a drink, I run to the bar and I get myself my $60 drink. But in your presentation, what I thought was interesting is that you're kind of reversing it. You're suggesting that these dance hall performers are putting the corporations in a position where they need to respond to the dance hall. And it's not just this sort of straight, you know, um, corporation dictates what the people are going to do, that in some ways this dance hall subculture ends up being able to um, push corporate culture in one way or the other. And so I was wondering if you comment on that. And then a question to um, Patrick. I know that you focus on the discourse um, in the media, and I was wondering if you who have experience being within the dance hall could talk a little bit about, you know, this crisis discourse within the dance hall. I think about certain things like if you're at a dance and uh, there's often a time when uh, the selector or various people get on the mic and say things like, anyone who has never put their hands down the pants of another man, please put your hands in the air. Something as crass as that which to me, I always find kind of ironic that someone would even want to voice such 
a mention of an activity in the interest of maintaining some kind of heteronormative space. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the discourse within the dance hall. All right. Um, in terms of the corporate culture responding to dance hall, what happened um, after 2005 with the coalition of corporate sponsors was that when that six pack of sponsors, JTB, Red Stripe, Cable and Wireless, Digicel, etc., withdrew, that some smaller sponsors came in and filled that gap for a little while. But also, you had Jamaican based corporations, brands, sorry, like Magnum, that were not a part of that public action. So the power was not strictly in the hands of the, the corporations. And further, what I have seen so far is that there are some events that do not get substantial, sustained sponsorship, like Sting, like Rebel Salute. These are events that refuse to, in the final analysis, to, co to conform, to change their core strategies. Rebel Salute with the no meat, no alcohol. Sting has gone back to the clash format after floundering a couple of years without the clash and did so successfully last year. What the corporations have done is to create the brandscape themselves, the Guinness Sounds of Greatness, the Lime Island Wide Tours, the reality shows, you know, even Magnum Kings and Queens. So, uh, what's his name? Stolsov has this hierarchy of power within dance hall, and at the top is the financiers and the corporate persons who use dance hall at the bottom second to the bo from the bottom is the artists below them it's only the the vendors and higglers what i have found is that in many cases it has reversed however there is a tendency by the artists to change their performance for the occasion of course so you will see sizzler on a arthur guinness celebration at uh, indoor sports center and he does the rockers tunes and he does that very well but he goes to Sting or he goes to Rebel Salute and then burn blue blazes on whoever they want to burn it on. So there is that adjustment and I have not interviewed them yet, but I suspect that there is a tendency to conform to the dictates of the corporation. So it goes both ways. And one more thing is that I have found that after 2005 with the coalition and then 2008 with Red Stripe alone, where there has been content that has breached any sort of codes, it has just been ignored. Like at events, like fully loaded. They simply have not sponsored the following year. I think, I think Mr. Green, right? No, no, on a different matter. You want to, you want to go back to something there. So Cordell first, because I know you're going to talk about the same corporate. No, no, not as yet. Oh, but it's a separate question. He wants to answer first? No, man. It's a different okay. matter. Okay, because I just want to make one comment and then a question to Mel. The notion of the positive and negative coverage of dance hall events. I hope that we will pay serious attention to the quantitative part because a story, for example, that says more dance hall records sold will have a narrow audience probably than one that says two killed in dancehall feud. I mean, everybody reads the latter. Some people interested in dancehall music will read the former. So I, I think we need to look at that, that we may come out with a balance in terms of positive and negative stories, but the impact of the negative stories the headlining of those negative stories will require some examination. I wonder, Mel, if you could say something about what some people see as the narrowness of the branding, meaning we have more things to promote than, let's say, concerts and dances. And you can see easily how um, rum feeds off a dance hall event. But we, we sell all kinds of services. We sell financial services, legal services. We have 
uh, clothes to sell, shoe, all kinds of things. Why aren't we seeing, despite the popularity of the music, a broadening of the branding uh, usage? One of the good, in, one of the good things about um, 2008, nine is that um, while this incident unfold with the corporate sponsor, Mel, we, we were there and I could literally predict that it was going to happen. So one of the things to look at too is event management affecting some discourses that take place in an event because there are people who should be backstage who are not backstage and there are other people who are backstage that should not be backstage. And the power and the influence that you could have over that artist making that blunder that goes viral internationally is timid. Because we could predict it. Okay? Um, you had something to say, Mr. Helber, on another matter. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, um, to the first question, um, if I got it completely right, the question was about um, that the measure of homophobia that it is of course depends on the the position from where it is articulated when i was um quoting peter tatchell in my presentation and all his kind of yeah in my perspective um exaggerated comparisons with um afghanistan taliban etc um i just wanted to make clear that i think that in this external debate of Jamaica, in the debate on, which was going on in LGBTI organizations in Great Britain or the US, and especially carried out through um, white activists, what happened was um, a kind of labeling of Jamaica as the non-modern state, and by doing this, more or less what they did is constructing themselves as the modern state. So we have this kind of old colonial process going on there that is the microphone, do you still hear me? Yeah, it's getting lower. So in this process, what happened basically was that um, like from the center of what they perceived as being modern, they needed somebody else to characterize as the other, and in this case, choose Jamaica to labeling it as absolutely homophobic and to um, yeah, may more or less reassure their own modernity by pointing with a finger on the Jamaican situation, which doesn't mean that in Jamaica there's um, not, I think, um, the problem of homophobia, but how it was portrayed, especially among LGBTI organizations in the West, I think was a kind of exaggerated and even sometimes racist way because it was more or less there to construct modern Western identity and less to f defend, uh, um, for example, homosexual people in Jamaica. Um, I hope this answered the question, which was the first one. And the second question about the crisis talk, um, I think the crisis talk, I'm not sure if I got it right, but this crisis talk, I think, is kind of omnipresent. It's not just in the media discussion, it's also in the popular culture, and I find it pretty often. Um, I'm not sure, I think, in my presentation, I tried to highlight that this, in the discussion on homophobia and dancehall culture in 2004, the crisis talk, I think, had this kind of purpose or had this effect of re um, reinforcing what I was calling respectability, but I'm sure that it has also other aspects carried there. And for example, now just comes to my mind that this crisis talk is also articulated in the song from Queen Africa, which is called Times Like This, where we also have this kind of reflection of a crisis. And even yesterday, I don't know who of you have been here at the opening speech of um, the Honorable Minister Lisa Hannah, she was also talking about restoring sanity. So we also have it there again that there is an assumption that Jamaican society is sick. And I don't say that it's sick. It's just this crisis which articulates sickness or um, articulates problems, which is permanent. And we find it in, se in several, or I, when I do the analysis of the media, I find it in several parts. I find it in popular music and I find it in like columns written by academics or, for example, elements of this discourse in speeches of politicians. So it's pretty omnipresent. And I think it's an interesting thing which hasn't yet been really analyzed. Thank you, pa thank you Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we have time for one more question. Hold on. Uh, Mr. Green, the narrowness of the advertising. Uh, 
there have been instances where it has gone outside of the, the products that I look at in, in what I'm doing. Um, sodas, alcoholic beverages, cell phones primarily. In the 1980s, NCB put um, Admiral Bailey in a tuxedo as their brand spokesperson when he was doing Punani and, and songs like that. Scotia Bank was big at the Trenchtown Festival last year. I didn't go this year. And RDI used Tanya Stevens, an assassin, for um, online, online degrees about, three, about five, six years ago. But the thing is that this sort of marketing, th those are exceptions, though. And the thing is that this sort of marketing is mostly geared at youth and geared at cheap, disposable products and products that you're always going to innovate. People are going to get a new cell phone when a new model comes out. That's what they're pushing at them. So there's something with much, much nutritional value. You're not thinking about it. You just keep drinking that thing. So it is geared specifically at that sort of youth market. Also, some of these companies do not have to advertise, I would argue, with dancehall or sponsor dancehall events because they get a lot of free advertising in the lyrics anyway. So when Assassin says, I have to be grateful anytime the Tina Grace pull, and then he has the Grace mackerel in the video, they already are benefiting from that sort of advertising. But they would be very careful, I would think, about sponsoring a live event. The, the crux of the matter is a live event where the DJ, the singer, can go off the script and, and say whatever he wants to say to excite the crowd at the given moment. And the Mario spoke about it earlier when he said that some people should have been backstage. When I spoke with Kim Lee, she spoke about briefing the artist when she was at Red Stripe, but then they go on stage and do something totally different. And there's that life component which I think they would be afraid of. And there are two shows that I would like to point at for getting sponsorship, as getting sponsorship outside of the regular Digicel and cable and wireless sort of stuff. One is Welcome to Jam Rock, which hasn't been on for a little while. But that got a broad range of sponsorship. That may be the Marley name. That may be the family connections to the Marley name. And there is also Fun in the Sun, fully sponsored by Jamaica Broilers. A gospel show, but a dance hall show nonetheless. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, panelists. So put your hands together, please, for our panelists here today. And Thank you, folks, for all being here. Clap yourselves, please. Clap yourselves. So we'd like to big up the UWI Cultural, Cultural Studies Department for this wonderful, wonderful event. And we'd like to... We, oh, we, could our coders please stand for the, pre, for the third presentation? Could, it, could the coders please stand? Clap them. <laughs> no, let me see. The seven of you are here. I'm Jermaine. You can't stand. These students have worked very hard to collect these 700 articles last summer and coded them to give us this data that we're presenting this morning. So take a bow. <laughs> so, so I guess we have a true database for the first time that the world can be um, you know, can, can, can be, um, you know, able to get their hands on. Okay, so before you leave, please note that we're reminding you about the Reggae Village at the Mary C. Cole Hall, which is just over there on the Ring Road, and also that you should attend, the, at the end of the session, the live instrument concert that's at the Old Dramatic Theatre at 12.30. It would have started 10, 15 minutes ago. So thank you, everyone, for your, for your keen interest. And long live reggae, dancehall, music. God bless you all.